we talked a little bit about homocysteine and its relationship to the the B vitamins. What I take from that, what you were describing there, is that if you are looking at blood test results, uh, particularly in the nutrient space, it's all about the context. It's the context of what you're eating. It's the context of your lifestyle. It's the context of some of these other markers. Are there other sets of markers that have that kind of relationship? I'm thinking particularly of the one that comes to mind anyway is vitamin D and calcium, which I know have a relationship. Are there other particular markers that you say, look, if you're going to look at the result of this, also look at this or think about these other sets? Well, certainly. I mean, we're talking here about the fact that like your cal- your, you could be eating inadequate calcium and taking in all the extra salt and animal protein and acids that drive the loss of calcium in the urine. And you could be, so your calcium could be losing, could be developing osteoporosis and losing calcium, but the blood calcium will be normal, right? Because the body, you could be taking an extra salt in your body all the time, but your body is excreting all the salt in your sweat and your urine is trying to get rid of it and your sodium in your blood is gonna be normal. So even when you're, so, or you could be deficient in, marginally deficient in zinc, but there's still zinc in the blood is normal. So sometimes we have to look outside the blood because it, so what I'm saying right now is the time the calcium in the blood is, starts to go down, that probably is calcium binding protein is going down. Because even when people are losing calcium, calcium in the blood doesn't go down. So that means calcium binding protein is going down and albumin is probably down if calcium is down. And that means the person is malnourished. So lower calcium in the blood accompanies with lower albumin and lower total protein means the person has poor assimilation of protein, poor digestion, and they may have something that's interfering with assimilation and absorption like, an, like cancer mm-hmm. or like a, they could be severely sick, malnourished cancer, something like that. So we usually don't see that. So yes, we have to look at other um, indicators to know what's going, to know what the cause is. So let's go back to omega-3s for a minute because within a, a typical blood test, I know within the, the one we're offering, there's a bunch of omega markers you're going to get back. There's a couple of omega-6 ones. Um, and then there's the, the individual omega-3s, and then you're going to get ratios. How would you read that set of blood tests from somebody? What, what kinds of things are you looking at there? I don't think it's important to know all the different index. To get the, I, I, mostly they're reading the omega-3 index. Okay. Because that's the most heavily studied there. Right. And the omega-3 index, we're looking to have a number, ideally above six. Let's say between six and nine. And this is effectively your total of the three. It's the amount, the percent of omega-3 fatty acids and the percent of total fat on the cell membrane. Now, to keep in mind that the red blood cell membrane, which members, measures the omega-3 index, we have a red blood cell turnover about 90 days. So if you're taking a certain amount of omega-3 supplement on a certain diet with a certain body fat, your body fat, your weight, the supplements and what your diet is on all affects your omega-3 index. But it has to be steady state for about four months. Because the the red blood cell turnover, if you just ate, if you started to lose weight and eat healthy and take the right supplements right now, take the blood two weeks later, the red blood cells are going to be the red blood cells that were circulating two and three months ago. So you got to wait four months to take the blood test for it to be accurate. Right. And I often tell people, well, lose some weight first and eat the right diet and take the right supplements, and then we'll test your blood maybe six months from now. You know what I mean? Because your body weight's going to affect it negatively too, just like body fat affects triglycerides and cholesterol. The saturated fat you have stored in your own body affects your cholesterol level and your, satur- and your triglycerides. So until you got your body fat and visceral fat low, your cholesterol and your triglycerides are not going to be optimized. Right. You know, so, so, we, so it's a moving target as a person is getting healthier. But yeah, I mean, the most important thing is the omega-3 index. And those other ratios kind of fix themselves. The arachidonic acid gets better. The excess omega-6 goes down with weight loss. So those things, the, the omega-3 index is the main things because that's where we adjust the supplements. Right. Just like with iron. With iron, you know, we look at, you know, iron sat and total iron binding capacity as maybe an indicator of iron overload in rare diseases like hemo- with hemochromocytosis or some, but mostly with iron deficiency, we see ferritin go down. Ferritin is iron storage proteins that go down when you're deficient in iron. It's the most sensitive to iron deficiency, except when a person has an autoimmune disease and they have a lot of inflammation because they're activated, like the rheumatoid arthritis being activated or an infection or a, or a cancer being, um, or an accelerated cancer, that could make the ferritin falsely go up. With it. But for most people who are not sick, ferritin becomes the most sensitive indicator to iron deficiency. Interesting. So we don't need to look at you know what I mean? So, so there are certain tests that are more sensitive and that we look at most, we consider to put more weight on. So if your ferritin is below 40, 
you should be taking some iron. But if your ferritin is above 60, you, it's better not to take iron because iron is an oxidant and to extra iron is not good for you to have extra. But if you're deficient, then, you, then it's better you take it. Right. So it's good to know your ferritin level, particularly for a woman, because us males aren't bleeding each month and our iron absorption is relatively pretty good. And most males have normal ferritin all the time. We could check it. But for females, either they're, having menstru they're losing blood with menstruation, they, they, should they supplement with iron or not? And you really got to know your ferritin to whether or not you should supplement with iron or not. Mm -hmm. And even postmenopausal women absorb iron at such different rates that some could need iron supplements because of low ability to absorb iron and other women don't. Right. So the only way to know that was the blood test is check the ferritin level.